In his brief 26 years on this planet, Aaron Swartz left an indelible imprint. A creative genius on the online world, he took his own life after being charged with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, something that could have had him behind bars for more than 35 years. Corey Doctorow was Aaron Swartz's friend, and he's here now to tell us more about Aaron and the bigger battle his death underscores. Here's Corey Doctorow, journalist and author of a new book called Homeland. Hi again, Corey. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Well, let's. We touched on this uh, during yesterday's conversation. Aaron, a yeah. friend of yours, who, uh, even though his name may not be on the tip of people's tongues, was a pretty influential guy in certain circles. Tell us about him. So I met Aaron when he was about 14 years old, uh, and he was one of these bright, homeschooled kids whose parents let him just go nuts on the internet and. and let it lead him. Let it. Let his interest lead him where that where it took him. And one of the things he was interested in was how the internet worked and influencing that. How the internet's technical standards, which are done in a very de democratic and open way. You join the mailing list. You kind of hammer it out with other people who have definite ideas about how the computers should talk to each other. And Aaron made these amazing contributions to a standard called RSS 2.0, and people were very impressed with them. And um, he uh, uh, got invited out to their meetings, right? They, they'd have these face-to-face -face meetings in San Francisco. That's where I lived at the time. And he lived in, Chica in Chicago, at which point he had to say, you know, guys, I don't think they'll let me because I just turned 14. <laughs> and so after they got over their shock of the fact that this kid had been 13 years old when he was making these great contributions, they really wanted to meet him. And, you know, lucky for him, there was a, a woman who lived in San Francisco, Lisa Ryan, who I was actually dating at the time. We're still great friends. And she offered to be a chaperone. And she was, you know, part of the, the standards body. And so we would pick him up when he'd fly into San Francisco. His parents would stick him on the plane. We'd get him. We'd squire him around. We'd show him all kinds of amazing things and me introduce him to people. He'd go to the meetings. We'd watch him eat and goggle at his horrific eating habits because he only ate white food. He would eat, like, potatoes, French fried potatoes, <laughs> pizza with nothing on it, uh, white toast. And and uh, steamed rice, but not fried rice, because that wasn't white enough. And you, you know, you talk to him, and you realize, like, if this kid doesn't got, die of scurvy, he's really going to go somewhere, right? <laughs> so in 2005, he joined the company Reddit, and they gave him the title co-founder. And he contributed so much to the company that that it was really crucial to them taking off, getting bought out by Wired magazine and its parent company, Condé Nast. He got moved into the Condé Nast offices where he really, or the Wired offices where he really didn't thrive. Uh, stuck behind a desk, and he, he very quickly engineered his own dismissal through a series of very um, public acts of uh, disobedience that kind of put his employer to shame. And they wished him all the best and showed him the door. And he really went off to do all the best. In 2008, he helped liberate a database called PACER, which is where all the US court filings are. So there's the law that Congress makes, the law that Parliament makes, mm -hmm. and then there's the law that judges make when they interpret it. And the law that the judges make, that's the pointy end of the law. And if you want to know if you're obeying the law, you need to know what the judges have said. Historically, it's been hard to get a hold of that because there's a lot of it, right? All the things con the, that a judge has written since the country was founded, that's a couple of libraries worth of material. But in the 1980s, they put it online with a service called PACER. And PACER is this online service that they charge seven cents a page for. And you can tell how old this is, that they had this idea that there was a page of internet, <laughs> right? So they, they somehow demarcated the internet in pages, and then they would sell it to you at seven cents a page. But in the US, there's no such thing as crown copyright. The law is public domain. So having paid for the law, you could do anything you wanted with it. You could sell it, give it away. And so um, uh, the, these researchers at Princeton created Recap, Pacer Backwards, and it was a little hmm. browser plug, and every time you paid for a page of Pacer, you could stick it in Recap, and no one would pay for it again. They would get it, the next time someone went to pay for it with a Recap uh, plugin, they would get the page you paid for. And so Aaron arranged to put $1.5 million worth of American court filings into Recap, which everybody thought was awesome, except for the FBI, <laughs> who opened a file on him. They, they staked him out. They brought him in for questioning without his lawyer, like everybody should do. He refused to talk to law enforcement without a lawyer present. He got mm -hmm. off scot-free. It was wonderful, but the next time it wasn't so great. The next thing he did that made headlines was getting involved with a thing called uh, JSTOR, which is another big database where all the scientific and technical articles are. And, and most of those are paid for with public money, either out of public research institutions and universities or, or um, uh, out of uh, uh, private institutions with public funding. 
And uh, although this was publicly paid for, and although it's important, it's the truth, right? That's what science is. And you know, not least every couple of years, someone will ask you to vote for them based on their theory of the truth. It'd be nice to know if that conformed to available evidence, but also because you never know, you might be that 14-year-old kid in Baltimore who invented a cure for, or a, an early detection kit for pancreatic cancer because he read an article on carbon nanotubes. You never know who's going to do something good with the truth. So. Um, it was kind of an embarrassment that you couldn't get into JSTOR for free. If you went to a big university or research institution, they would pay for a subscription. Otherwise, you'd have to pay by the article up to $50, $60. So Aaron, at this point, was a fellow at Harvard. He started walking up the street to MIT, where they have open Wi-Fi. The public's allowed to use it. The public's allowed to come on campus. And the public is allowed to download from JSTOR on it. So he wrote a script that started downloading thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. They tried to lock him out. He, he kept getting back in. Finally, I guess enough was enough. Tired of cat and mouse, he, he snuck into a wiring closet. He, I mean, he just turned the doorknob. It wasn't locked or anything. And a homeless guy kept his clothes in it. It was a public place, you know, a semi-public place. But he connected a laptop, and he downloaded millions of articles. And that's when they arrested him and charged him with Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, charges. Because although he was entitled to the article, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says that if you exceed your authorization, on a computer that doesn't belong to you, you commit a felony. And what they said was, well, the terms of service, that long, gnarly hairball of impenetrable legalese you click through 25 times a day, said you won't automatically download, that that's a felony. It's not a contract violation. It's a felony. We're going to put you in jail for 35 years unless you plead out. Do you know what he planned to do with those articles? Nobody really knows. He'd done, he'd done some scholarship before where he downloaded 400,000 law review articles and showed how there was systematic funding of law professors by corporations to write law review articles that were favorable okay. to them. So he didn't Maybe he was going to do that. He didn't Maybe. want to just download for the, case, for the sake of downloading. There was a method to it. Maybe he was going to release them. We don't know. Maybe he was going to release the public domain ones. Maybe he was going to do some kind of big data analysis and go, look at how much of this is publicly funded. Right? We don't even know how much of JSTOR is publicly funded. Right? All of these things are opaque to us because nobody can do big data science on JSTOR. So nobody knows. Maybe I, I think it's a good bet that some of it would have ended up in the public because that's, that's how Aaron rolled. But we don't know. You know, 97% of the people who are indicted in the U.S. plead guilty. And it's not because America has psychic prosecutors who only get it right 3% of the time. It's because the threat of 50 years in an overcrowded prison system that's so inhumane, the, the American Supreme Court ordered the Californian prison system to start releasing people who hadn't served their sentences because the crowding mm -hmm. was so inhumane that it didn't matter what you'd done, you didn't deserve that, that people settle. Right? They don't want to bankrupt everybody they know, fighting a fight that if they lose, they go to jail for 50 years. Conrad they Black to three. came to the same conclusion. Conrad Black set, settled. I'm not a big fan of Conrad Black, but I think he's right on this one. And so um, Aaron didn't settle. He figured, you know, all they got me for at this point is taking too many books out of the library. I was entitled to those articles, just not as many as I took. I didn't do anything with them. They can't possibly be serious. But, you know, as the prosecutors told Congress, once they arrested him, they had to put him in jail or it would have been embarrassing. Well, can I tell you what they said? Here's Carmen Ortiz, U.S. attorney whose office prosecuted this case. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, stealing is stealing, whether you use a computer command or a crowbar, whether you take documents, data, or dollars. It is equally harmful to the victim whether you sell what you have stolen or give it away. So yeah, Carmen, she, that's a woman actually, Carmen Ortiz. Her boss was mm. Steve Heyman. Um, so Carmen Ortiz really misconstrues things. So first of all, JSTOR, the publisher, dropped everything. They were completely uninterested in, in pursuing Aaron, and they said no harm had come to them. Um, it suggests that Ms. Ortiz is not only unfamiliar with computers, she's also really not on speaking terms with crowbars, if she thinks that this has anything to do with either. Um, you know, what Aaron had done was downloading. And what he had done was download scientific articles. This was not Hollywood movies. These were articles that had been essentially expropriated from academics. Um, you know, academics, uh, in order to progress up their career ladders, have to publish with journals. In order to get into a journal, you have to assign all your copyright to the journal. These academics are never paid for their work. So the, all of this stuff had been coerced out of them. The copyright had been coerced out of them into these journals. The only reason they did the science was to have it read. Why do you put your articles in a journal? Mm -hmm. Because it will be more widely read and more cited and get you up the career ladder. So all the authors ever wanted were for these things to go up the, were, were for these things to be widely read. The authorities did not see it that way. Well, the authorities, I mean, this is what she said in her press release, but what she said to Congress was not this. What she said to Congress was, we arrested him and it would have embarrassed the prosecutor's office if we didn't put him in jail. Hmm. So they would not offer him a deal that it didn't include a million dollar fine, jail time, and a felony conviction that would have prevented him from being in politics, from being a lawyer, 
from working with kids, from becoming a doctor, all these things that could have been in his future at 26. And, and you know, two years to the day after his arrest, he hanged himself in his apartment in Brooklyn on January the 11th. What was his initial response to that offer that was made by the prosecution? Well, you know, when you read what the people who were closer to this said, you know, Quinn Norton published an article in The Atlantic about, about um, what she heard from Aaron. She was very close. She's a, she's a good old friend of mine. I'm her daughter's godfather. And I actually, and the reason she met Aaron, and, and she, when she talks about what, ha what happened with Aaron, he was really upset by this. You know, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that it had come to this, that a federal prosecutor would use the whole weight of the state to crush someone who had, who, had been reading scientific articles. Like that, that, this, that this is, you know, whatever else America was or wasn't, that it wasn't a place where you put people in prison for reading scientific journals. Okay, you, you, let's stipulate, you knew him way better than I did, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but this court case, it could be said, wasn't the only reason why he took his own life. He, he was battling some mental health issues at the same time, was he not? Aaron had written publicly about depression, but you know, um, there are lots of people who get depressed. People who face 35 years in prison have an especially good reason to get depressed. People who, who, whenever they meet with a federal prosecutor, that federal prosecutor is abusive and hostile and shouts at them and promises to make their friends' lives a living hell. They were bringing in every one of Aaron's friends. Quinn, who I mentioned before, was a journalist. They were going to get her to, um, they were going to subpoena her hard drive, make her turn over all of her confidential sources and every every um, article she'd worked on, she said she wouldn't do it, so she was gonna go to prison. Her seven-year-old daughter, my goddaughter, would have been left with a mother in prison and, and her mother's good friend, Aaron, in prison because she wouldn't have been able to help him out. He knew which buttons to press the prosecutor um, and he was gonna get his man. I mean, that 97% conviction rate, that, that doesn't come out of nowhere. So you have no doubt but that the the preponderance of the evidence suggests that he took his life because of the charges. Yeah, the date was not a coincidence. I think Aaron would be alive today if that prosecutor had been able to put aside the momentary embarrassment that his office would have felt if it turned out that they'd gotten it wrong. If he'd been able to put aside the, the bragging rights he would have gotten in the, in the cafeteria after he put another notch on his bedpost, I think Aaron would be alive today. Have you or anybody you know followed up with the prosecution's office to find out their reaction to Congress all of this? did. And? And they said it would have embarrassed us not to put him in jail. But I mean, so they had no regrets they about the no fact regrets. that, that no, he no, took no. his life. I mean, that statement you read from Carmen Ortiz, mm -hmm. no regrets. They, you mm -hmm. know, they, they, are, they are sitting there saying, you know, we did what we had to do. It was the, you know, he was in the wrong. It was the, you know, we have to keep our country safe. Safe from what? Safe from people who, who download too many scientific articles? Like, really, that's what we're keeping the country safe from? The law that he was uh, charged under, I guess, is almost three decades old now, is it not? Yeah, and, and it arguably doesn't penalize what he did, but it would have bankrupted him to argue this out in the court. You know, in fact, we've had prominent judges say, so here's where it, here's where it starts. 1986, Congress wants to pass an anti-hacking law because up until then they've had to do unbecoming things like charge you with the theft of a microwatt of electricity for breaking into a computer and erasing all the files on it because erasing the files wasn't a crime, right? And this is unbecoming and silly. So they say, okay, we're going to pass a like a sui generis actual anti-hacking law, but they don't want to enumerate the list of bad things that you can't do because that'd be a long list. And if you made that list in 1986, you need another list in 1987. You need another list in 1986.5. Sure. Right? So instead they say if you exceed the authorization on a computer that doesn't belong to you, you are a felon. Right? So uh, at the same time we have this growth of, um, of license agreements, these, these weird things that you have to click through that all amount to, like by being dumb enough to use this service, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother in the mouth and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge, or whatever the Facebook equivalent is, right? Nobody reads these, everybody clicks through on them, everybody is in violation of all of them, and the prosecutors put two and two together and they go, this says what you're allowed to do, if you do something you're not allowed to do, you're a felon. Mm. If there's anybody we don't like, there's a computer fraud and abuse violation in their recent past, we can charge them with a felony. And we don't even have to go to court and find out whether a judge thinks that this is what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says because 97% of the time they'll plead guilty. <laughs> and so, you know, in the wake of this, Zoe Lofgren, who's a California uh, politician, introduced a bill, Aaron's Law, to basically add a little preamble to the CFAA that says, you know, for avoidance of doubt, prosecutors, this does not mean that if you violate terms of service, 
that it's a felony, right? Like violating a contract means being a felony means that I can turn you into a felon by writing my own laws, right? We everyday people shouldn't be able to put each other in jail simply by making up rules that other people violate. That's not how the law should work. Are Aaron's parents still around? Oh yeah, of course. And have they like what have they done in light of what's happened? To well, him? they're really upset and they're really struggling with this. I saw them last at the funeral, though I've talked to his dad a few times since on the phone and. Um, Aaron's dad and his brothers and his mom are all trying to work on the stuff that matters to them. They all have their own projects, but they're also trying to keep Aaron's memory alive. And there's so many of us trying to figure out what to do to make, to make sure that his legacy isn't lost. You know, preserving his data, preserving his legacy, setting the record straight, but also things like, um, you know, some of us have been looking at the fact that uh, uh, journals, when they publish these articles, they get the copyright assignments from academics. But the academics are working for universities, and they produce the articles in the normal course of their duties. And in the absence of any other agreement, that should be what we call a work made for hire. Just like you don't own the copyright to this broadcast, mm -hmm. academics don't own the copyright in the, in the papers they write unless they have an agreement with their employer that says otherwise. So all of these journal articles have been published without adequate permission. So if we could get a few universities together and create a class action suit and bring it against the journal publishers, they're on the hook for statutory damages, $150,000 per download per article. We say, look guys, you owe us like nine times the planetary GDP for the next trillion years. How about if we settle for just making all this science that was already paid for by the public, public access? And the reaction has been what? Well, all the, all the lawyers that you talk to about that get a gleam in their eye. So hmm. we'll see where that end, ends up going. Harvard's uh, Lawrence Lessig, who I guess he described Aaron as his, his mentor. Teacher. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he said that what's at stake in this battle is the future of ideas. Yeah. I guess that reflects what you just said. Well, I think that when we say that um, uh, the primacy of our knowledge arrangement, the way we array knowledge, is, is about the commercial arrangements of the 20th century rather than the things we can do in the 21st century. That what we do is we tie ourselves to the limitations of the 20th century. I mean, why did Pacer cost seven cents a page to use in 1986? It was because computers were slow and stupid and big and bulky mm -hmm. and expensive. And like, you had to shovel hay into the cage of the brontosaurus that went around and around the wheel that kept the computer going. But 2013, you should be able to run Pacer off a Nintendo DS, right? So, so do we, hew to the um, crumbs of commercial advantage that were gained by the um, few players who were in a position to make Pacer public, like Westlaw, the big legal databases in the 1980s? Or do we create enormous wedding cakes of value by making this stuff available so that we can, for example, cross-reference the whole of the law. We can import the whole thing and find out, for example, if there are judicial trends. If we can find out, as, as some um, uh, savvy defense lawyers have found out, that parole boards are more amenable to your client's case if you don't hear a case just before the lunch break, hmm. right? I mean, there are things that we can do with big data, you know, like, like the midwives who will tell you that um, women are more likely to need their labor induced if it's a Friday afternoon at five o'clock than any other time of the day or night. Having access to the data, having access to the truth tells you something that you don't get if you can't access that stuff, if we can't bend, spindle, mutilate, and fold it in the way that our computers have let us do in this century that are totally unique to this century and that offer the power to learn things about our world that have been hidden from us and that will make us better people in our world. So what is the argument used to suggest that there would be harm in doing what you've just described? Oh, you read it aloud. Um, Stealing is stealing, whether you do it with a crowbar or a laptop. No, but, but, but it's, it's an incoherent argument. Why, why no is Pacer there. still locked up? Pacer is still locked up, I would say, because um, there are some big commercial firms that pay enormous licenses for Pacer, and then in turn take Pacer and make it available uh, in expensive databases. And those firms are expert at lobbying. And so as a result, uh, you know, there, there is no lobby for the public domain. The, the, the value of the public domain is diffused, all of us. It's in all of our fingers, right? Uh, the value of a, of a commercial monopoly is concentrated. And so the commercial monopoly doesn't have to overcome the collective action problem of getting everybody who benefits from the public domain to all go and beat up on a lawmaker who's proposed a stupid bill, whereas the one commercial monopoly that has secured from the government a commercial monopoly over something that should belong to all of us, like the law, 
or the maps. I mean, this, this country, the United Kingdom where I live, maps, postal code databases, all these things that are of vital importance, right, are, are not in the public domain. They're owned by the crown. You have to take out uh, horrendously expensive licenses to use them, to build businesses on them, to find innovative ways of doing them. Why did Google Maps show up in the US first? Google Maps showed up in the US first because the US Geographical Survey doesn't own its maps. Anybody can use them. And as a result, you had dozens of competing map services in the US because the startup costs did not include a 100,000 pound a year fee as we have in the United Kingdom to pay the Ordnance Survey in order just to use the map data that the public already paid for. Many services competed. We came up with the best service that we have. And then if there's another service that comes along that's even better, they'll go out and they'll make their own map. Uh, they'll be able to make their own service using the same map data that Google has, uh, has access to. Hmm. So the problem with the public domain is that its, its benefit is diffused. But the advantage of the internet is that people who have diffused interests can find collective action, as we saw, as we talked about last night on, with SOPA, with, with the uh, American Copyright Bill that was overcome by millions of people. Well, some people have portrayed that, since you brought it up again, as kind of artists versus pirates. Mm -hmm. Do you like that characterization of this? No, I don't think so. Well, first of all, I've never met an artist who, who didn't have a huge library of things that they've copied. I mean, to be an artist is to copy everything. You know, it's, we, we act as though, you, you remember Lily Allen spoke out against um, music downloading and then it emerged that she had on her website mixtapes she'd made for people to download for the public to download where she hadn't cleared the copyrights why did she have that music available because the way that you become a musician is by using other people's music I mean think about it mm -hmm. musicians commercially perform each other's compositions they learn on each other's compositions they duplicate each other's compositions it is the norm in music Beethoven's uh, or, or Brahms's first was called Beethoven's tenth Right? Hmm. Every jazz solo you've ever heard includes two or three bars of a song that, that is familiar to you. And we all say that that's right and proper. But as soon as you use a computer to sample one note, you've got a court coming after you and saying, oh, well, when, when we did it, when, when the people who wrote the law that is to their advantage now did it in the last century, that was legitimate taking. When you do it with the art that they made, that's stealing. Hmm. Right? Uh, and I think that it's wrong. I mean, we all take in order to make art. There is no art that is made out of the holus bolus. And every person who makes art thinks that the part that they made is a precious snowflake and that the stuff that they borrowed is mere plumbing. <laughs> and there, that's true. But the thing that someone makes out of my work will treat my precious snowflake as mere plumbing. When Edgar Allan Poe invented the detective story, that was a precious snowflake. But it would be insane to say that everybody who wrote a detective story should be paying royalties to Poe's descendants, right? Because it is now plumbing. It is both of those things at the same time, <laughs> right? So um, yes, people want to download and people want to do all kinds of other things. But uh, among the greatest downloaders, among the most prolific downloaders, the prolific copiers are artists. But more importantly, you know, you look at the things that Aaron has done. You look at the fights that we've all gotten into about copyright and so on. And you'll hear people on the other side say ridiculous things like, oh, that's the information wants to be free crowd. I've never known a single person with a dog in this fight because information wants to be free. I had a long, compassionate heart to heart with information and it confessed to me that the only thing it wants from any of us is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. Because <laughs> information doesn't want a damn thing, but people want to be free. And you make people freer when you don't add surveillance and censorship to the internet in the name of stopping copying, which won't work anyway. You make people freer when they know what the law is. You make people freer when they know what science says. You make people freer when they're free to congregate, when they're free to organize together, when the truth of their world, their maps, their geographic data is available to them freely and without let. That makes people freer. Who cares about information? In our last minute, Corey, let's come full circle. Yeah. Aaron's legacy. What do you think it is today? I think we're still making Aaron's legacy. I think that there's so much code that he wrote and so many ideas that he brought forward and so many groups that he worked on and helped found that it's, it's all rippling out. And I think that you know, there are people talking about doing a conference. There's, there's Aaron's Law. There's um, various databases that are being made public in Aaron's name. Academics put millions of PDFs of their research into the public domain uh, in Aaron's name after his suicide. I think we're still, we're still trying to figure out what it is. I think we'll still be thinking about Aaron's death in many years. But I, I take it you think the, the important thing is that the death not go in vain. Something good has to come Absolutely. out of Absolutely. You know, he wrote the afterword to my book, Homeland, and he talks, about, he talks in it about how they killed this SOPA bill. And at the end, he says, it wasn't supposed to be this way. A ragtag bunch of kids typing on their laptops weren't supposed to be able to stop one of the most powerful forces in Washington, D.C., but we did it. 
and we can do it again, but it only works if you take part. Well, we thank you so much for taking part these past couple of days, Corey, and we wish a safe flight back home to London. Thank you. And your 600 square foot <laughs> yes, my apartment tiny little for the three of you. With its hunchback mice. You know, if you move back to Toronto, you can be get a bigger place. You Not know that. much bigger. Have you seen the condos they're building? <laughs> Holy moly. No, but you could afford a house if you live oh, in I'm Toronto. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So good of you to spend so much time with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Corey Doctorow, his latest is called Homeland, and we're grateful for him coming into TVO tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.